Okay, everybody, let me urge you to take your seats. Everybody, take your seats if you would. Good afternoon. Let me wait a minute or two just for the last few people to sit down. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Janet Gornick. I'm a professor of political science and sociology here at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and I'm also the director of the Stone Center, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you all today in my role as head of the host committee of this meeting of the Society for the Study of Economic Inequality. And speaking for myself and my three senior colleagues in the Stone Center, uh, that would be Bronko Milanovic, Paul Krugman, and Leslie McCall. We welcome you here to the seventh meeting of ECONEC, to the Graduate Center, and to the City University of New York, and welcome to New York City. Yay. <laughs> So let me tell you um, what I'm going to do here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you for about 15 minutes, and I'm going to do three things. I'm going to tell you a, a bit about Econnect, the society, and the meeting. I'm going to give you a very brief portrait of the institutional host, CUNY, the Graduate Center, and the Stone Center, and then I'm going to run through a few key logistics for the meeting. And after these introductory remarks, you're going to be treated to the main event of this session, which is a conversation about inequality between the New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio and Paul Krugman, and they'll be introduced by the president of the Graduate Center, who's Chase Robinson. Although we would have loved to have had the mayor for longer, the demands on his time, of course, are enormous, and his schedule allowed him to be with us only for 30 minutes, so we're gonna try to keep on, on schedule there. Uh, Econec, I think a lot of you will know this, but let me give you some background. The Society for the Study of Economic Inequality was founded in Palma de Mallorca in July 2005 as a nonprofit association supporting the study of economic inequality and related topics. The specific aims of ECONEC are to provide an international forum for researchers interested in the study of economic inequality and poverty, bringing together a diversity of perspectives, and also to provide interactions among researchers, policymakers, and others interested in inequality and poverty and the policy measures uh, designed to address them. ECONEC is governed by an executive committee, which includes a president, a president-elect, a secretary, and a treasurer, and their work is supported by a council with 13 members. These positions are filled through elections by the ECONEC membership, and ECONEC now has more than 250 members affiliated with a wide range of universities, civil services, and NGOs uh, around the world. The founding president of ECONEC was Sir Tony Atkinson, and sadly for all of us, Tony died on January 1st uh, of this year, and there'll be a number of events here at the conference dedicated to Tony's memory and legacy, including the keynote address immediately following this session and the dinner on Wednesday evening. The other past presidents of ECONEC were Jean Esteban, Francois Bourguignon, Jacques Silber, and Ravi Kamber. The current president is Martin Revalian, and the president-elect is Frank Cowell, and they're both with us here. Uh, the, the secretary of Econec is Claudio Zoli, and the treasurer is Javi Ramos, and uh, they're also here. So it's my pleasure, really, uh, very much to, uh, to uh, welcome the leaders of Econec here. Econec has an official journal, the Journal of Economic Inequality, and a working paper series, and the Society holds a conference every two years dedicated to promoting academic debates, encouraging exchanges of opinions and ideas, and obviously uh, research results. At each ECONEC conference, there's a local host committee and also a program committee. And this year, the host institution, that's us, is the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality um, in partnership with our parent organization, the CUNY Graduate Center. And the, uh, the host is in charge of organizing the local uh, conference. The conference program is the responsibility of the ECONEC Executive Committee, chaired by the president-elect. This year, 475 papers were submitted for consideration, and the executive committee chose 280, with presenters coming from more than 30 countries. The accepted papers, of course, will be presented here this week, spread across 79 thematic panel sessions. In addition to the rich offering of papers, this year's meeting will also feature keynotes and plenary addresses to be given by Peter Lindert, Mark Fleurbay, Joseph Stiglitz, 
and Econec President-elect Frank Cowell. Uh, and this year's program will also include the inaugural lecture of a new lecture series known as the Stone Lecture on Wealth Inequality. And this first one, the 2017 Stone Lecture, will be given by Gabriel Zuckman. Past Econec conferences have been held in four European countries, Spain, Germany, Italy, and Luxembourg, and once in Argentina. This year marks the first time that the Econet Conference has been held in the United States, and my colleagues and I here at the Graduate Center are honored to have been selected as the first US-based host of an Econet meeting. And what better place to discuss inequality than in the United States? A country that's famous among the rich countries of the world for its extremely high levels of income and wealth inequality, and its historic resistance to redistribution and other policies that reshape what markets produce. And what better time to be in the United States, exchanging ideas about inequality and public policy than this year, one of the most complicated, unpredictable, and unusual years in American history. The conference hosts. Some of you already asked me, what is the City University of New York? Um, CUNY, as we're called, is the public university serving the city of New York. It's the country's largest urban public university and the third largest university system in the United States. We have 24 campuses. 275,000 matriculated students and nearly 7,000 professors. Why hold a major conference on economic inequality at the City University of New York? Well, perhaps the best reason is that CUNY itself is a massive project aimed at reducing socioeconomic inequality and enabling intergenerational mobility. When our first college, the City College of New York, was founded in 1847, it was described as an experiment whose purpose was to educate the children of the whole people. And 170 years later, the mission's intact. Today, almost 40% of our undergraduates come from households with an annual income of less than $20,000, and 42% are the first in their families to go to university. A recent study by Raj Chetty and his colleagues identified the 10 colleges in the United States that produce the most economic mobility for their students, and five of those 10 are CUNY colleges. Uh, CUNY, and I'm going to tell you something about the Graduate Center, CUNY, with a design unique in the United States, has dedicated one campus just for graduate study, and that's the Graduate Center, uh, which is where you're spending your three days this week. The Graduate Center now is a tiny school embedded in this very large system, and we enroll about 4,000 graduate students across a wide array of disciplines. Committed to CUNY's historic mission, the Graduate Center provides access to doctoral education for diverse groups of highly talented students, including those who have been underrepresented in higher education. Our PhD students are a crucial component of our instructional capacity, and as they pursue their own PhDs, they teach and train over 200,000 of our undergraduates every year. The Graduate Center has long been a venue for teaching, research, and public exchange related to multiple facets of inequality, and a lot of our faculty and students have long engaged in work exploring inequality, drawing on multiple disciplines and utilizing diverse analytic techniques, qualitative and quantitative, theoretical and empirical. And in the last five years, led by the president, Chase Robinson, who you'll hear from shortly, and now our provost, uh, joined by our provost, Joy Connolly, the Graduate Center has set uh, as among its highest priorities, expanding our capacity in research and teaching in the field of socioeconomic inequality with an emphasis on empirical work, on high quality data, and on quantitative methods. The Graduate Center has worked toward that goal by investing in new faculty, uh, expanding opportunities for visiting scholars, developing specialized courses, and providing a platform for public programming and debate. One of our primary goals is to contribute to and to deepen this very complicated national and international conversation about inequality that's been unfolding in recent years. And what is the Stone Center? People have asked me that as well. In 2006, I became the director of the Luxembourg Income Study, LIS, the Cross-National Data Archive in Luxembourg, which is well known to many of you, and I'm proud to say the data source of quite a few papers uh, this week. And that year, I opened a small office, the LIS Center here at the Graduate Center. The LIS Center grew over the years, and in 2016, thanks to the support of two philanthropists, Jim and Kathy Stone, our center was expanded and renamed the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. And the Stone Center, which still contains the United States Office of LIS, the Luxembourg Income Study, has expanded rapidly, and we now have four affiliated professors, and that would be me 
and Branko Milanovic, Leslie McCall, and uh, Paul Krugman. And now we have a growing cadre of students and affiliated senior researchers. Uh, all of us from the Stone Center are here this week, and I hope you'll get a chance to meet um, most of us. So our work on inequality, again, as I said, which is heavily empirical and quantitative, is carried out in an array of research projects, courses, workshops, and public events. And in the last four years, we've had on this stage and on other stages here uh, in the building over 20 events focused on inequality. They're all on, the videos are all online on our YouTube channel. Uh, they've addressed the relationship between inequality and economic growth, globalization, technological change, immigration, climate change, health, the sharing economy, and the economics of care. Um, and in addition to those of us from the Stone Center, these events have featured a number of prominent inequality scholars, including Tony Atkinson at our first event, Thomas Piketty, Joe Stiglitz, Angus Deaton, Nick Stern, Nancy Fulbray, Gita Sen, Heather Boucher, and others. So again, the Stone Center is really excited to serve as the host of this 2017 ECONEC conference, and I know I speak for the Graduate Center's senior uh, leadership as well. Throughout the last year, as the Stone Center prepared to host this conference, uh, Chase and Joy, our president and provost, uh, offered a huge amount of enthusiasm and support, intellectual and material, yet another marker of their deepening commitment to supporting world-class research and learning related to inequality. Okay, the conference, you all have conference packets with lots of information. I'm certainly not going to repeat uh, all of this. A couple of things to say. All of the plenaries will be held in this room. Um, all of the panels, probably know this already, are either on this level, the concourse level, or uh, on the ninth floor. All the coffee breaks, all the lunch breaks, everything is on this level. There's a book exhibit. Uh, I hope you'll all get a chance to visit it in room C197, and I definitely encourage you uh, to stop in. You'll find displays of about uh, over 100 books with order forms, and some of them have uh, discounts specifically for the conference attendees. And I do thank the presses for contributing these display copies at the end of the meeting. They'll be donated to our library. And finally, a map of the building is located in your packet. You might be interested to know that the Graduate Center's building here in the heart of Manhattan was home to the B. Altman department store from 1906 until 1989. And in 1985, this building was designated a New York City historical landmark, and we've occupied it since 1999. So last but not least, what should you do if you need some help? Um, we have a team of 10 volunteers. They're wearing t-shirts which say on them, I love New York. Of course, what else would their t-shirts say? They're also, if any of the rest of you are wearing t-shirts that say I love New York, you should probably take them off. Um, <laughs> they're also wearing name badges with blue ribbons attached. The conference volunteers, of course, can only offer basic support, but they're prepared to call in tech support or administrative help uh, if you need it. Uh, the volunteers are mostly PhD students, mostly in economics, uh, many of them here, but not exclusively from the Graduate Center. Uh, given our shared concern about inequality, I do want to assure you that while we call them volunteers, they are in fact being compensated for their labor. They're being very poorly compensated, but they are being compensated. It's not our mission here at the Stone Center to impoverish graduate students. We leave that to the American system of financing higher education. <laughs> I do hope you'll get to meet and interact with these marvelous volunteers during the conference. Our host committee staff has been coordinated for many months by Natasha Boweri, and she has done, uh, she just finished her PhD in sociology here at the Graduate Center, and she's done an extraordinary amount of work, and I hope you'll... Yes. She has done and supervised an extraordinary amount of work, and uh, I do hope you'll get a chance to meet her. And finally, I'll be here through the whole conference, and I hope all of you will call on me at some point. Now, in just a moment or two, we'll be joined by our esteemed guests. When we were named host of the seventh ECONEC meeting, I understood that part of our job was to organize this welcome session, and I knew immediately that there was one person who I hope very much would join us, and that's the mayor of New York City, Bill de Blasio. Mayor de Blasio attracted widespread attention in this city, across the country, and internationally when in 2013 he focused his first mayoral campaign squarely on a platform of reducing inequality in New York City. For those of us engaged in the study of inequality, Bill de Blasio's unique campaign and his subsequent administration have been captivating. Mayor de Blasio appeared on this stage last year to talk with us about his administration's priorities and plans 
and we're immensely grateful to have him back with us today. It's now my pleasure, I hope, to welcome to the stage New York City's Mayor Bill de Blasio, who's joined by Professor Paul Krugman and the Graduate Center's President, Chase Robinson. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Janet, for those kind uh, remarks. We weren't here, but we could hear you, actually. Um, it is a great pleasure as president of the Graduate Center to welcome you all. That's the first order of business, to uh, reiterate Janet's uh, war very warm welcome to all of you. But also, I have the, uh, the very distinct honor to, uh, to be able to introduce our two speakers. Let me begin with our in-house colleague, our very own Paul Krugman, who will lead that conversation about inequality with Mayor de Blasio. Paul, as many of you will know, is a New York Times columnist. He's a blogger. He's a tweeter. He's also a prolific author of many academic and popular texts. He also um, is a Nobel laureate in economics and he um, was named that laureate in 2008. Now here at the Graduate Center, we're extremely careful about the quality of our faculty, so we waited until 2014 <laughs> before we invited him to join our faculty. We didn't want any flash in the pan economists. <laughs> so in 2014, Paul came as um, a senior scholar at LIS, and in 2015, he joined our PhD program in economics as a distinguished professor. Now here I will speak in a more personal mode. During uh, the last three years, Paul has been an immensely generous colleague, teaching, helping to build the Stone Center, and appearing on this stage many times. The Graduate Center, thanks to Paul, is increasingly recognized as a venue for the study of economic inequality. Paul has been a crucial contributor to that project. Mayor de Blasio is the 109th mayor of New York City, a position he has held for nearly four years. At the heart of the mayor's campaign was his call for establishing universal pre-kindergarten in New York City. Nearing the end of his very first year in office, the New York Times editorial board noted regarding his initiative in pre-kindergarten, no other city has done something so big so quickly, and it would not have happened but for Bill de Blasio. Indeed, his administration can claim many substantial accomplishments. Today, in New York City, nearly 70,000 students are enrolled in universal pre-K. Since 2014, New York City has built or preserved 78,000 affordable homes, a record high and the city is on track to build and preserve 200,000 affordable apartments within 10 years. As of 2018, 50,000 New York City workers will be covered by a $15 an hour minimum wage, up from $11 an hour. 20,000 New York City employees now receive paid parental leave, a benefit that in many parts of the United States is enjoyed only by workers with the most resources. And between 2013 and 2015, the percentage of New Yorkers living in poverty fell from 20.7% to 19.9%. In the mayor's own words, inequality is something that I'm going to speak about every chance I get, everywhere I go, because this is a crisis facing our nation, and our city. Mr. Mayor, I can assure you there is no better time than now and certainly no better place than the Graduate Center. Thank you for joining us and for helping us to welcome this extraordinary group of inequality scholars to New York City. Paul. Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd love to 
spend some time thanking you for being here, um, but I know that your time is short, so let's plunge right in. Um, so last year, you and I spoke, um, and we were talking about how excited many people, not just the kind of people here, but the, the city at large was, uh, how excited we were all were that you had made inequality a major theme of your campaign, mm -hmm. um, that you were trying to do something about it. Um, but there were also some questions that we asked. Um, how much difference can a local government, even a locality as big as this one, how much difference can it make? So what do you see as your, as your accomplishment so far, and what would you like to do heading forward from here? Thank you, Paul. Uh, Paul, first of all, thank you and everyone here. Everyone, I love the fact that there are people who make this their focus because I really believe this is one of the central issues of our time. So thank you to all of you for your focus on fighting inequality. Um, look, uh, the answer, I got, I got the question actually about could local government make a difference? The day I announced the vision on pre-K it was October 4th, 2012. It was almost a year before the election. And, and at that time, as you know, I was promoting a tax on the wealthy to achieve it. And I, I offered the proposal and I did a press conference after. And the immediate uh, tone of the questioning from the press corps was, well, how can a city make a difference? And if the federal government's not with you, isn't it going to be impossible? And I said then, and I even believe it more strongly now, if we're going to fight inequality, it's something that has to be done at every level of life and every level of government. And um, the notion of just waiting on an idealized federal government to ride in and save the day is arcane to say the least. In a government and as big as New York City, as strong as New York City, in a city like this, we, we were certain we could make a real difference. So uh, the things that we've done so far, some of which you've heard delineated, that pre-K, which is both about the long-term fight against inequality by giving uh, kids of all backgrounds education, but also relieving immediate economic strain on families that would have had to pay for it anyway. The same with our after-school programs, uh, the same with paid sick leave, which provide a benefit that uh, hundreds of thousands of New York City workers didn't have. Uh, obviously, affordable housing. All of these are things activated locally that um, reduce a burden on working people and None of them had a federal component. Some of them did have a state component, to be fair, but we fought for that locally. We created the conditions for achieving that. So right now, when we look at the overall picture, when I ran, we talked about 46% of New Yorkers at or near poverty. Right. Um, today, that, that has gone down 2% uh, in the course of the last three years. Uh, the, by the end of this, calendar year, we believe about 280,000 New Yorkers who were previously at or near the poverty level will be lifted above. And that is because of all the uh, elements I talked about before and because of a change that we fought for in Albany, the increase in the minimum wage, a lot of which the, the work on that started here and thankfully was ultimately adopted in Albany. Those numbers speak to what is possible uh, at the local level or certainly the combination of the local and state level, no federal role whatsoever. The, the point on that obviously is if you had a federal role, you could go many times farther. Right. But I'll conclude this point by saying I've talked to mayors around the country, including in places that have much more modest resources than New York City. But my message is, you know, uh, the, to borrow the hackneyed phrase about the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, is like do something, start down the road. A lot of places, for example, have found modest ways to increase revenue so you can get pre-K started. Or they've done something narrow but vitally important like paid sick leave, even if it's five days a year. And these, are the, these are the first steps on the road to uh, reducing inequality. Every place can do it. You've seen how many states have voted for a minimum wage increase, including red states, in referenda. Uh, everyone do what's available to them, and it all starts to build a bigger critical mass and a bigger a demand level all over the country. Yeah, I, I, just to say, I, when I looked at, you know, did a little homework for this, the scale of the pre-K achievement is really amazing. Thank I you. have to say that's an amazing thing. Um, affordability, can yeah. we talk about, I mean, that was one of the things, that's one of those areas where you think that local governments, um, particularly a, a big city government, can make a big difference. And I, I, the, I, the, the absolute numbers of what you've done are very large, but everything in New York is, mm. is very large. Right. 
Um, the need is very large. The need is very large. If I, I, I just got this afternoon a, a report sent to me that on um, affordability around in metropolitan areas, and New York is still considered severely unaffordable, although better than, you know, better than, than uh, Hong Kong. <laughs> Right. Better, better, better than a lot of places. Better than Miami, but still extremely high. Uh, uh, what? And, and rents have continued to go up at least a little bit during your term. Mm -hmm. uh, housing prices have continued to go up. Do you see what? What? What do you see heading forward as a way that might make this a, a city where ordinary workers are not priced out? It, so the, the, the formula I work on all the time is sort of we, the, we do feel like we have a race against time dynamic here. Yeah. The um, Population is growing. The interest in being here is increasing. The economy is growing. I mean, some of these, of course, are very good uh, realities. But, but the question to me is, how can we preserve or create enough affordable housing to keep New York City, New York City, right. to really keep it that rich mixture of people that, that we value so much? The difference in New York, and I, I wish more places had this, you know, we have some foundational elements that are long gone or never existed elsewhere. We have uh, a public housing authority that has 400,000 New Yorkers living in its apartments. Right. We have rent stabilization, you know, a version of rent control uh, that covers between two and two and a half million New Yorkers with some rent uh, protection, some, some limit on what kind of increase can occur. Now, we used the power that that gave the city to say, all right, we're gonna determine rent increases very carefully in terms of the, the total economic reality of New Yorkers, of tenants, the real costs involved. You won't be shocked to know decisions like that were made in the past with a slant towards landlords and a slant towards the private right. sector. Uh, you'll appreciate, we said, let's actually put objective data, in, objective data into the mix and let's equally consider the needs of tenants. And what we ended up with was two years with rent freezes for those folks in rent stabilized housing and uh, more recently a decision to have a very, very modest increase for the next year. So these tools, most places would, would envy deeply. But the new things we've added to the equation, as you indicated, 70,000 apartments that have either been subsidized and preserved in place, usually on a 30-year basis, or building new apartments uh, that we finance. Some, some are built, some have begun, some at least the financing is in place and on the way to being built. Um, that took a very creative approach to financing, and it took a very aggressive approach to land use. One of the things I'm very proud of, we passed a law uh, almost two years ago that mandated any time there was a government decision to rezone and provide the opportunity to real estate developers to build bigger or higher, that an affordable housing mandate came with it, of either 25% or 30% of all apartments, depending on income levels. Um, these, you know, what I would say to everyone here is these tools, they're usable anywhere in principle. Some places don't have as strong a uh, history. Some places have obstreperous state legislatures that might try and preempt. But, but there's so many different tools for at least beginning to fight the affordability crisis. A lot of them are usable uh, anywhere. But when you add up the, the, the almost two and a half million people in rent-stabilized housing, the folks in public housing, the folks who are gonna be reached by our affordable housing plan, and something I'm also very proud of, we've started a new initiative with the city council to provide uh, legal help to anyone facing eviction. So now in New York City, this year, by the end of this year, uh, anyone who makes, any family, it makes up to 50,000, so 50,000 or below, that is faced with eviction that might be illegal, gets a lawyer for free from the city of New York to defend them against that eviction. By the way, not only do I think that's morally appropriate, um, as an economic equation, we pay relatively little to provide that lawyer, but if we save that family from eviction, uh, we keep an affordable apartment affordable, God forbid that family ended up in shelter, a family in shelter nowadays is about $40,000 a year. So both morally and practically, a very smart equation. So all of these tools have added up to provide affordability for well over three million people. And that's a big core within our city that helps to keep balance here. Yeah, actually one thing that I learned doing a little homework, and Janet Cornick and I were doing some homework, is this is, this is a renter city to an extent yes. that no one else is, completely off the charts in Correct. terms of, yeah. So that's, that, these are big deals. Um, but still, um, land use, anything more coming? I mean, we, we talked a little bit last time about 
basically opening up more spaces. And uh, so far, that's what you're talking about is more about requiring affordability as part of developments. Yes, one thing we've tried to do that we have not succeeded at, but I think it's only a matter of time. I mean, obviously, our political reality is constrained not just by Washington, but by having a Republican state senate in Albany. I think that one of the residues of the Trump election could be a, a sea change in New York state next year uh, in terms of our state senate. Um, if that happens, that opens the gateway to what we call the mansion tax, which is really a lovely phrase, because it speaks, speaks volume so clearly. It says that uh, anyone who purchases a home uh, over $2 million, the purchaser, pays a little more on the real estate transaction tax. All that money is used to create uh, affordable housing for senior citizens. That would get us 25,000 apartments for senior citizens, just subsidized, right. in addition to our current affordable housing plan. So it's a very discreet idea of going at those who are doing very well, who purchase within New York City, it's a marginal increase on the tax they would pay. Obviously, it's something they will not feel too deeply. But again, to think about 25,000 more affordable apartments being added in the mix, that's another powerful thing that hopefully is only a year or two away. That's, I, I'm enough of a, of, a, uh, of a New Yorker living in privilege to think two million, that's not, anyway. Um. <laughs> Oh, but for most, I think you could say uh, the, other, the other part of you no. that studies uh, economic reality, for most people, the notion I'm, of a $2 million home I'm, is a rarefied reality. I, I'm well aware of it. Yeah. It's, uh, it just, it just, it's just funny uh, the, 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 what, what one becomes accustomed to yes. in the city. Uh, um, minimum wage, I want to talk about. So this is, we have a big increase, right? It's quite yeah. fast rise from 11 to 15. Correct. Um, are you nervous about it at all? No. I understand the conventional wisdom of, you know, largely propagated by some elements of the private sector that says, oh, there could be a dislocating impact uh, in terms of reduction in jobs or reduction in hours. Um, as we've seen the first phases of the minimum wage increase, we've not seen that. We're at right. the lowest unemployment. We had a few months ago, we, we literally had the lowest uh, monthly uh, unemployment number we had had since the current measure was developed in 1976. Um, New York's economy is very strong, very diverse. Again, we're luckier than many in that vein. But I, I see an economy that's continuing to grow in terms of areas like tech and life sciences, for example. I don't see um, an increase in minimum wage inhibiting that in any meaningful way. We, now, we have to keep an open mind. You know, right. We could get down the road to $15 minimum hour and see some unintended consequences. But so far, no, I feel pretty good that it will achieve its goal with limited unintended consequences. Okay, yeah, there was, there's been a lot of fuss, you probably know about Seattle, and yes. um, for what it's worth, I've done some homework and I don't trust that study at all. Yeah. I think it's a, it was not, it was not a, a controlled experiment at all, and, and it's a, so I think we probably should still feel fairly comfortable. Not sure $15 an hour would work everywhere in America, but here right. it should. Right, and look, I also think it's fair to say there's a little bit of the reality of the crying wolf that we've seen previously where efforts to increase minimum wage have been accompanied by, or, or things like paid sick leave have been accompanied by dire predictions about the economy, and certainly from a New York City perspective and New York State perspective, they've never come true. So we should never take our eye off the ball in terms of some, uh, some things happening that weren't expected, but the history we've seen is the classic that you know better than anyone. It, it, puts more money into the active economy. Right. Uh, I'm gonna indulge myself, since uh, something that wasn't in the prepared questions, but it, it shouldn't upset you. Um, I wish a, I only dealt with prepared questions all day, but no yeah, such luck, Paul. But uh, no, um, one, of my, one of my fields is economic geography, and I've been tracking, uh, I'm sort of not, I'm not all the other things, that there seems to be this ongoing revival of of uh, corporate interest in being located in, in the big cities. Yeah. We've been seeing the suburban campuses downscaled or shut down. Are you seeing that? Are you oh, seeing yeah. a lot of that? Is this a... Yeah, and you know, the, it's striking. I remember just you know, five years ago, as recently as that, still feeling um, envious of the suburban areas that seem to have uh, the ability to attract uh, the headquarters of different companies. 
And then only in this last five years, from my perspective, I've heard more and more stories about the inability to get talent to go there. Right. And the, the desire, particularly of younger, talented people, uh, to be right in the center of the action. So we saw um, some companies uh, think about going to the suburbs and deciding not to. We saw some companies in the suburbs come into the city. Uh, I think you're going to see more of that uh, because the competition for talent is so intense and it's become a lifestyle reality, which in a funny way, the pendulum has swung back right after World War II. As you know, there seemed to be, you know, everyone was, or not everyone, but there was an overwhelming urban population and then a rural population, not a lot in between, and people became enamored of this notion of living in a leafy suburb and having the two-car right. garage and all that. That, to a lot of people today, is an outmoded reality. And by the way, uh, reality doesn't fit their values. They'd rather be in a city where they're not traveling long distances and uh, they're with a diverse group of people and they have access to a lot of interesting culture and food and everything else. And, and I think that augurs well for cities, big and small. It does slightly, at least. Um, to some extent, what you see is that, that corporations take the high-end stuff. They take the, uh, the executive suite, the high-tech people, and move that into Manhattan, and, uh, um, which is, does slightly exacerbate the inequality issue here. It does yeah. make the city, so yeah. But it's, but it's certainly a favorable trend. That, uh, one of those things that's kind of lucky for the city, I think, for any city, but particularly this one. Um, all right, I can't have you here without asking a CUNY question. Uh, we, we, we had, for those who aren't here, we had, a, a, we were very excited, we had a presentation by Raj Chetty uh, on upward social mobility and the role of, of universities in it, and, um, and it turned out that, um, rather gratifyingly, CUNY, the CUNY system is completely off the charts in terms of its success of, yeah. of moving, um, but it's a pretty, uh, you know, it's constantly financially beleaguered. We're, uh, this, uh, this is, the, for those of you visiting, this, this, this campus is the luxurious one in, in the system. Um, and, uh, and we're worried, what, have any thoughts about uh, what can be done to reinforce this, this huge resource? Uh, you probably, I don't know if we mentioned this last time, but you know that both Janet Gornick and I are, are CUNY babies. Both of yeah. our parents attended mine, Brooklyn College, hers, uh, CCNY, and it's continuing to fulfill that role, but we're scared because it's always in, in danger of not having enough resources to do that role. Well, your parents and Janet's parents taught you well, and your uh, loyalty to CUNY is strong. Um, this is what I'd say. The, no, having a major public university is a huge blessing for New York City, and it's also a strategic element right. to how we build our future. The, there is a governance problem that we have to be straightforward about. The governance structure of CUNY resides the power in the state of New York, which comes with joys and sorrows, but there's a remove to that that I think is somewhat problematic. We end up in the city of New York, we have a set level of contribution we make for the two-year colleges, the community colleges particularly. We've chosen to add investment that's gonna be uh, about $100 million a year soon in terms of a focus on two-year STEM programs and things like the ASAP program, which has been really successful at helping uh, young people come out of our public schools and sadly we still are not preparing the way we should and helping them get some of the extra help to really glue their experience in CUNY and, and help them towards success. So, you know, getting beyond just remedial education into something even deeper. Those investments have proven to be very worthy. We intend to stick with that. But in terms of the kind of larger vision I'd like to see for CUNY, I, I think we're a little stuck because of the governance reality, because that vision can only be actualized by the state of New York at this point. And we're going to push and we're going to try and create an environment where the state takes more responsibility for a long-term vision, but, um, you know, unlike the things that the city controls directly, like the uh, school department, you know, the, the Department of Education, the, the um, police force, you know, the sanitation department, those we have to have a vision of because we control them and we believe in having that kind of strategic vision. This split reality doesn't help for maximizing what CUNY could be. Uh, throw in another, just would you like to talk to us just for a minute about the subways? Well, yeah, no, it's, it's painful. I, and, and, you know, I 
found myself, I have a lot of respect for Rahm Emanuel. I don't always agree with him ideologically, but I found myself agreeing with his recent op-ed, which is that the, the MTA, which is another one of these things that distracts from who's really in charge. You know the history. The MTA yeah. was literally created as an authority with no discernible accountability structure so that there could be fair increases voted on by a board that no one knew who they belonged to, right? right. Yeah. And it was clever, but, uh, and, and maybe in the politics of the time it was created somehow, it, there was a feeling there was no other choice. I'm, I'd like to believe we're in a better time now when we can be more upfront and transparent about these things, and certainly the experience of mayoral control of education is a great example of that, which is only 15 years old. But because the MTA isn't clear who it appears to, to the average New Yorker, who it belongs to, I should say, to the average New Yorker, the fact is it's run by the state of New York and therefore the governor. Uh, what I've said is, you know, Rahm's point rings true that the MTA in New York, unlike uh, the Transit Authority in Chicago, did not invest in the most basic, uh, unsexy, uninteresting uh, maintenance and, and development of the, the behind the scenes infrastructure of the subway system and we're paying for that now and we better quickly right that wrong. Uh, and I have urged the governor and the state to do that very, very quickly because we're, we're in a crisis now. And I've said if they don't, I'll present my own alternative plan and try and generate uh, support for it. But I think it's a, it's a referendum on something we have here. I don't know how many other parts of the country or the world we have this with these you know, authorities to nowhere that obscure uh, accountability and transparency. I, I think given the, particularly the infrastructure challenges of this moment in history, having very clear lines of accountability are, are amongst the only ways to ensure that there is timely action, including on the things that uh, aren't popular in the short run, but are decisive in the long run. Yeah, just uh, you, you think about, in a lot of ways economically, the city is, is stronger than ever, more attractive as a place to live, and then every day you wonder, is stuff going to be strangled by a, a fire on 145th Street or something Correct. like that? It's amazing. Correct. And it doesn't need to be, obviously, given the, the resources we have uh, in the metropolitan area. It, something's wrong with that picture when you can't keep your economy running properly every day, even though it's a booming economy. Yeah. Um, trying to minimize national politics in this discussion, but uh, <laughs> good luck with stuff, that. Stuff been going on out there. Uh, obviously, we have a president and a yeah, Congress. Since we last met, Paul, yeah, something changed. Yeah, since we last met. Um, what was that thing that changed? Uh, <laughs> how is that affecting you? How is that affecting your efforts? Today, it's been minimal. I think in a week or two, that could change, tragically, because of the uh, health care vote in the Senate. Uh, what was interesting is, um, the efforts by the Trump administration to act unilaterally by executive order obviously ran aground in a number of cases. Right. Uh, they've threatened to try and take away our funding over our immigration policies. That has not worked, or they've not had the uh, willingness to really follow through on the threat so far. Um, even the last uh, congressional action on the budget with the budget reconciliation, the omnibus bill was a lot less severe than we expected. In some areas, the budget even grew for in intra-congressional reasons. Right. So the next act in the drama is the Senate vote on the health care bill and, and talk about a tale of two cities. I mean, there's one, there's one outcome that is devastating where we could uh, see more than a million New Yorkers lose access to health insurance and we could see an impact on our uh, public hospital system of hundreds of millions as much as even half a billion in the short run. The other scenario where the, uh, they can't mount uh, a bigger effort to undo Obamacare uh, keeps us stable and, and allows us to keep, in fact, adding people under Obamacare. And there's almost a half million New Yorkers who qualify who are still not uh, registered. So we have this ridiculous skew here. We don't know which one it's going to be. We do assume it's going to be resolved in a matter of weeks. The next big uh, point after that, of course, will be the budget in September, where we do expect some big challenges. But it, it has been a profound threat that's caused us to put real big reserves in place and brace ourselves for impact, but we have not felt the impact yet. That's, I guess, sort of encouraging. It's, look, it's six months that could have been a lot worse. The way I look at it is incremental. We have been able, in terms of the program that I described and, and you described at the beginning, we've been able to keep it going essentially undeterred 
for another six months. I, I consider every additional month a blessing so we can deepen the impact. <laughs> that's a, an amazing thing that we're sitting here and, and saying gridlock, that's what we need is gridlock. Yeah, there's something to be said for, when, when Donald Trump is president, there's something to be said for gridlock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Mary, I know that you have a, a, we were told anyway, that you have a very hard deadline. Yeah. We have a couple of minutes before sure. that deadline. Anything more that you would like to say right now? Yeah, I will say, and I mean this, I, um, I am more optimistic than when I started. And uh, I really think this is a question of audacity. A lot of the things that have happened here were not supposed to be doable. I don't mean to be melodramatic, but right. it's a literal fact. Uh, we've talked about the income inequality, uh, inequality issues. I'll give another one that I love to talk about, and I'm sure you've paid a lot of attention to, which, you know, the 2013 campaign for mayor was largely about policing, and I strongly believed we needed to reduce an unconstitutional policy of stop and frisk. And to a one, there were elements of the establishment that said that that would lead to chaos and increase in crime. We reduced stop and frisk by 93% and crime has gone down three years in a row to all time lows. I'm simply saying that to all the scholars, and I hope you are scholar activists, uh, because I lived with some blinders on, like anyone else who had done this work for a, a long period of time, of thinking some things could only be done incrementally or we could only get so far so fast, only to find that there are moments and there are conditions in which you can move very quickly. And political will is essential. So pre-K, you know, I, I asked the people for a mandate and the people gave me a mandate and I believed in it and the grassroots believed in it. And we were able to move mountains. The practical part of it, the logistical part, sure came with headaches, but it was there for the taking, as was the affordable housing plan, as was increasing paid sick leave. I mean, if you look at the core elements of this agenda, each and every one came with their sky is falling prediction from elements of the mainstream in this city. And this is, you know, here's this wonderful, progressive, sophisticated city. Each and every one, the dire things that would happen if we gave you know, hundreds of thousands of more people paid sick leave, or if we increased the minimum wage, or if we did the affordable housing plan, or if we reduced stop and frisk by our police. Two a one, they either weren't supposed to be doable or they were gonna come with these horrible unintended consequences. None of that happened. So after three and a half years, I find myself uh, a bit of a changed man because I have more faith uh, in what is possible and more willingness to challenge the conventional wisdom that taught us always that it wasn't possible. And I, I conclude this analysis with, you know, I, I heard a phrase years ago and I liked it then, I like it more now, is from the, the French revolutionary Danton and the phrase was simple, audacity, audacity, and still more audacity. <laughs> okay. So that's how I'm trying to live. I'm not sure that a national politics citing French revolutionaries is going to be the best strategy. But, My thing. But I agree. And uh, um, according to the instructions I've been given, if you want to keep on talking, we'll take, take you for hours, but I believe we're at our end. I think, I think our time has come. But again, I commend everyone for the good work you're doing. And Paul, you're a, a voice of clarity and, and values we cherish in a very difficult world. I thank you for that. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody.